Hey, Facebook friends, it's another week of Puppyology Online. The last couple of weeks we have gone fully online so we can safely stay at home and shelter in place. I hope you're doing well uh, wherever you are, at home with loved ones. Uh, and our prayers are with you as we all are in this journey together and what we can do together will make it stronger. So again, welcome to Pup Theology. Uh, the last few weeks we've had some really good episodes right online. You can go back and watch those uh, Facebook lives and Facebook videos, either on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And uh, right now I am with some other great friends of mine to talk another round of Pup Theology. So I'm going to bring them up right now. With me, I have my co-host, Becca, Becca McNeil from Christianity Today. We have Alex Bailey from Black Outside Incorporated. And we have Professor Langston Clark from UTSA. And uh, we'll all be discussing uh, mainly today um, the good work that Black Outside does uh, for uh, people of color and getting them involved in the, out, in the outdoor world, get them involved in nature. The, the, the topic for today is uh, racial reconciliation in the outdoors and race place where we find our that place in nature. So that's the topic overall. You can read about it on our description. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, Black Outside and the work they do, you can ask those questions below. We're also going to talk a little bit about how COVID-19 is affecting uh, populations uh, disproportionately, especially communities of color uh, during this crisis. So if you have any questions about COVID-19, uh, or Black Outside, please post those questions on our Facebook page and we'll see those comments and ask that. So, uh, Belka, Becca, welcome and uh, introduce Langston, who will then introduce Alex. <laughs> um, so, with us we have Langston Clark and he is a professor at UTSA and I will say that most of my interaction, if not all of my interaction with Langston has been at Pub Theology as someone who's not afraid to ask really challenging questions. And I've always appreciated that because I think sometimes um, people wonder if it's worth it to bring up tough topics. They wonder if it's going to just be them, you know, spinning their wheels while everybody else nods and, and half listens. But Langston has always laid it out very plainly in a way that I think is an exercise both of good faith and earnest, um, like an earnest thought, but also that doesn't let anybody get away with BS. And I appreciate that a lot. And so I'm really happy that he's here, happy to learn more about what Alex Bailey does, but I'm going to let him share um, more about Alex. All right, so I'm gonna take that baton from, from Becca and um, just wanna thank uh, Gavin and Becca and you know the Pub Theology community for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to introduce uh, someone that I know is doing great things here in the community in San Antonio, uh, particularly when like African-Americans here in San Antonio are in a, in a weird place because we're, we're the minority of the minorities. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to have a uh, nonprofit that is dedicated to black children getting outdoors. And so Alex Bailey here is the founder of Black Outside. And I just want to give him the opportunity to give us some insights into why he founded Black Outside and why it's significant to have um, an organization like that here in San Antonio uh, for the black children that live here. Yeah, thanks, Brother Langston. Uh, you know, it's really a blessing and an honor just to to just learn from you uh, and grow with you alongside you. I think ever since we crossed paths last year uh, at uh, our Brotherhood Summit. Um, so, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So, yeah, I'm the proud founder of Black Outside uh, Inc. Uh, we have one simple mission to reconnect black youth uh, to the outdoors. Um, and we're really intentional about that word reconnect. Uh, black people in America have had a very prominent history in the outdoors and some of it's very tragic and some of it's very triumphant, right? But we still have a history that's in, that's ingrained there. And so what we try to do is really reconnect youth and, and, and really dismantle the message that black people don't go outside, right? Uh, and in reality, the, the, as we know, the, there are huge benefits uh, to nature experiences, whether it's just like walking around outside or like deep wilderness experience of backpacking and camping uh, that really can benefit our youth. And so with that in mind and knowing that there's a huge gap in outdoor programs, for black youth uh, across the state of Texas here, only 1% 
of Texas state park participants identify as black. And across the country at summer camps, only 4%. That's one out of every 25 campers is black, right? To me, that's an injustice. And that's something that we've got to really move the needle on. And that's why we found a black outside to really push the envelope and ensure that there's a program that's catered for into uh, the black community. So uh, thank you, Alex. I'm just um, glad to ha have known you and, and hear that mission that you have for uh, Black Outside. And it's interesting. We had a conversation. I think it was the first time I met you. Yeah. You talked about like the history and the inspiration for Black Outside was rooted in um, a Black woman that lived here in San Antonio. So yeah. if you could give us some, some of that background and how uh, her efforts sort of inspired you to do what you're doing here in the community now. Yeah, great plug. And actually, I'm wearing the shirt right now for Camp Founder Girls, our summer camp. So one thing y'all should know about Black Outside, if you've never heard of our organization to so people locally here in Texas or across the country, is uh, we are an umbrella organization, meaning uh, we partner with schools to provide outdoor programming. Uh, we also have a summer camp component. Uh, we also have a specialized program for youth that have been impacted by uh, incarceration titled the Bloom Project. Um, but one of our special programs that we run is our summer camp for black girls titled Camp Founder Girls. And so uh, what's really cool about it and unique to San Antonio is that it started here in San Antonio and it was the first, America's literally first summer camp for black girls in 1924. Uh, and so there was a powerful woman by the name of dynamic visionary woman by the name of Maddie Landry uh, from the east side. Uh, and she uh, had this vision that she wanted her, her young girls to get outside. And so you can imagine the context of Texas uh, in the 1920s, right? Uh, she didn't have equitable access. She tried to get her girls to have a segregated, essentially camp with another camp called Camp Fire Girls. Um, and they said no. So she said, you know what? I'm going to found, quote unquote, my own camp. And that's how Camp Founder Girls started. And she ran the camp from 1924 all the way through the 1960s, impacted literally thousands of girls uh, from the east side of San Antonio and throughout the city. And unfortunately, when she passed away, uh, the camp ceased operations. Um, and so when we heard the story, we uh, we definitely decided we had we felt moved to really resurrect this project. And uh, last summer was our first year resurrecting it. We served 29 girls. Uh, this summer we were uh, anticipated on track to, to serve uh, 60 plus girls. We're gonna double in size. So, uh, but we're really, really excited. And you can follow that on Camp Founder Girls Instagram page if you wanna see some really beautiful pictures of our, uh, of our young women. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool story. Uh, you know, I, I do want to uh, spend a lot of time talking about Black Outside and the, and the good work and the racial reconciliation component that y'all promote. Uh, but uh, real fast, there's a lot of people watching and uh, the COVID-19 is happening all around us. We're sheltering at home. Uh, and I do want to talk about uh, how it affects uh, uh, COVID-19 has been affecting communities of color, especially the black community at much higher rates uh, than other communities. And so I'll let Becca lead that discussion for the next few minutes. And I think that is something that our, our, our listeners would want to talk about, especially with two great leaders like Links and Fox here. So Becca, can you, can we all lead that discussion? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, I think we, those two things can tie together because one of the disparities I'm seeing in the COVID-19 um, epidemic is that one of the few things we can still do is go outside to big open spaces, you know, the, the Texas parks have closed and city parks have closed because people congregate there. But if you have access to private land, which we know that most of Texas's outdoor um, area is private. And that's one of the big barriers is that it's private and it's owned by white folks. And so I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about in this time, how efforts like yours are on hold because now in addition to, you know, whatever work you were doing before, there's the work of finding access to private land to make this happen. And so it's just one more example of how the things that we're holding on to for well being in this time are disproportionately available to white people. And um, so, se segueing, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, on the disproportionate, um, like the land, the fact that we don't have a whole lot of public land in Texas. What does that mean for your organization? But then also um, kind of segueing into, I was 
just watching the live stream. I don't know if y'all were watching it. The BET News did a live stream with Nicole Hannah Jones and John B. King and everybody about the disproportionate um, impact on the black community. Not, I mean, I was looking at the numbers in San Antonio and it looks like it is hitting the black community hardest. Not even, you know, we say communities of color and we lump, you know, Latinx people in there, but it looks like this is, is truly, at least in San Antonio, the numbers are, are staggering. And so, um, I would love to hear y'all's, both of your comments on that, but then also, um, tying into what Black Outside is doing, um, to get at some of those disparities that then lead to the other disparities that we're seeing, the health, the underlying, um, underlying issues, what are the pre-existing conditions, those things. Um, so yeah, I'd love to just get y'all just talk about that. Whatever, whatever it is that you think we need to hear. You, yeah. You want to start off Langston? Um, I guess okay. when I, 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 when I think about the outdoors, um, so in, in, in my community of researchers, um, I'm a physical education teacher educator. So that means I prepare people to teach physical education, uh, K through 12, and also with individuals with disabilities. And so um, with some of the, the literature that I've, I've read or been exposed to, it's talked about the levels of physical inactivity among black children, but it's also talked about the amount of screen time um, that, that, that black children have, which is much higher uh, than other communities. And so when I think about um, you know, underlying conditions, right? So uh, having diabetes or, or, or some of the other health conditions that are preventable through, in, in part through physical activity, and then our lack of access in many communities to the outdoors, how those things go hand in hand and being outside creates opportunities for physical activity, but also creates opportunities to detach from um, screens. So I, I think in a lot of ways, what Alex is doing is more than just um, more than just exposing kids to nature. It's an opportunity for children to be physically active in ways, Black children to be physically active in ways other than athletics, uh, which is good. Yeah. Uh, and to add to that, to tie into even your question, Becca, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's to be honest, when we launched Black Outside, and by the way, we are a uh, baby organization, as I always joke about. I always say we've been around for hundreds of years, right? Our spirit and energy, but we've now just manifested. Um, and we we weren't founded till literally a year ago, essentially, when we had our first outdoor experience. And since that point, we've been able to serve uh, over 180 youth across our city uh, in one year. So, um, all that being said, I, I think what made our 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 work challenging at first was that, right? I connected and learned from uh, outdoor organizations in California and New York, and they were like, yeah, we could just hike here. We could do this. Everything's public, right? And and the reality is in Texas, over 90% of the land is private, right? And then you layer that in with the historical inequities around race and class, right? And who has access and who owns the land. Uh, so with us, we've, we've been really blessed that we've been able to partner with some great organizations that have opened up space and place. And even from a financial sense that, hey, we'll lower the cost to make sure uh, there's some sense of equity in who's using this space. But it's still a huge uphill battle. And then you think about what that feels like at the local level, because most of these private lands are uh, where you might have deeper wilderness experience, deeper outdoor experience where you can really plant a love of nature. Um you know, they're farther outside the city and most of the youth we serve are in urban areas. So right now with COVID, it, it does make it tough. One thing that I've been advocating for in our local community uh, has been the use of greenways. Uh, I think they're super important. They're uh, over 40 miles of trails across our city. And uh, it's a very safe place to, to get outside in a uh, safe and social distance way uh, in the area that we live. But um for our work, yeah, it's critically important. I mean, land's one of the, the biggest hurdles that we have is having access to land to be able to do what we do. That, that's uh, like so many things. When I'm reporting on education, people will pitch me um, stories about um, get the need to nature school, get kids outside. You know, this is important. Kids need to see green and there's, there's design elements. And 
typically the kids being served by those things are white. And um, it, like every other um, feel good story that gets pitched to me, if I scratch hard enough, I find that there is a, an equity story underneath. Um, and just like this COVID thing, I mean, in some sense, like it is going to require the entire community. Like when we say we're all in this together, like it is going to re require the entire community to flatten the curve and all that stuff. But in another sense, um, the black community is in a totally different boat on the whole. Um, not that, you know, me, Becca and you Langston and you Alex are in a different boat, but um, when you're talking population levels, um, there's, in any sector, any way you want to put the Venn diagram to overlap it, education and COVID, work and COVID, um, you see that not everybody is um, safe in the same way. Not everyone is in danger in the same way. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that we talk about those things and we want to talk about them in this acute way when we talk about COVID. But what you guys are talking about is the myriad of ways we're going to have to have this conversation now that we are all chitter chattering about the immediate effects. And so talk, let's just talk more about the equity that's increased and the, the ways that if if we could increase this, you know, more getting more access to the outdoors let's just say if, if your work had exploded 50 years ago and you had had all of, all of your big goals had been achieved 50 years ago, how would COVID might look different? How might COVID look different today? Yeah, I very much appreciate that question and it's something I've actually grappled with a, a good bit. Um, yeah, I mean, it starts like just for context of 50 years ago, I was sharing this with 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 uh, Langston. I was rereading the diary of Malcolm X. Right. And in the first chapter, uh, he talks about growing up in Michigan, a northern state that he's like, no black person was allowed to. This is in the 19, you know, 30s and 40s. You know, this is when my grandparents were alive. No black person was even allowed outside after seven o'clock. Right. And so like just that idea of like we were literally like legally blocked from being outside at certain time periods. And especially when you think about unsafe places, it just created this this effect where like we were pushed into indoor spaces. Um, and then to contextualize today. Yeah, I think COVID would look a lot different. Uh, we think about some of the like if you literally go on the CDC's website and look at the underlying conditions for COVID-19. Uh, right. You can see diabetes, asthma, all these things. And who is disproportionately impacted by those is black people. Right. And I think about one case in point is asthma. Right. Uh, as some of you may know, like climate change is very much impacting the world around us. Um, but the sad part is the the population of kids that is most disproportionately impacted uh, by climate and environmental degradation. Are, is the black community. You think about where some of the uh, factories are, where some of the oil refineries are, especially like in the Houston area and other areas. And that's not to knock anybody who might be in that industry. But if you, the reality is you look at them, a lot of times they're very approximate sometimes to larger black communities. And so uh, the sad part is this has been happening over and over and over uh, for years and decades. And then now when COVID hits, all these underlying things are under the surface and they kind of pop up. And I think the other piece too for us is that, uh, thinking about access to parks and green spaces, as you talked about where, you know, pull up a map of a lot of big urban areas, Chicago, um, you know, Dallas, some of these other areas and look like literally where are the most green spaces and what type of neighborhoods are right near those. Right. And what do our parks look like and feel like in predominantly black communities versus predominantly white communities, to be honest. So uh, I think those are like some big pieces there where you have on top of like we're getting hit with environmental injustices in our community on top of that, like literal access to safe green spaces um, combines and uh, has this effect where um, where we as a people, right, are, are are more prone to develop diabetes and other health things. And I, I would love to pass the, to Brother Langston on that too, especially because I know you've done some work thinking about that. So um, I, I'm just, the first thing that comes to mind is, is the overlap or the intersection between um, access to the outdoors and the environmental justice movement. And so I think, I think even like Rebecca was talking about um, 
a lot of times when you see uh, images of, of people outside camping or whatever, most of the time it's, it's, it's white folk or white folk who appear to have access to, to nature in ways that black folk don't. Um, but, but behind that is, is the fact that we a lot oftentimes are um, placed systematically into communities that, um, that are toxic. And I, I'm not talking about like toxic in a social sense. I mean, like literally like there's toxins in the environment. And we, we oftentimes as black folk don't get credit for being part of the environmental movement or being environmental activists and things like that. Um, when in many cases, um, for example, uh, Dr. Robert Bullard, who's at Texas Southern University, is the, uh, the, the, the father of the environmental movement. And, you know, we, we have a place in those movements to reclaim nature and to reclaim the outdoors that oftentimes uh, doesn't get shed light on. And so as we think about Black health, um, we, I, I just think uh, within our own communities, uh, if we think about like black institutions, like black churches or mosques or or uh, other institutions have to be mindful of um, how we provide access to to our community, and our children to the outdoors. Yeah. And if I could add really quickly to that, um, you know, Becca also, you know, you talk about another intersection. She mentioned education, too, and like the way our schools are set up. Uh, and, you know, I'll be honest, I, I've been to. Uh, I've had the chance to uh, observe over 30 plus schools here in San Antonio. Some are doing really, really amazing work. But sometimes what troubles me uh, is that schools that are in some predominantly black communities uh, limit are the ones main ones to limit recess time are the way main ones to limit outdoor opportunity. There are some that are definitely pushing that and thinking critically about that. But there are others that have leaders that say, well, we have to catch them up on mass. So we they only need 10 to 12 minutes of recess right mm -hmm. a day. And these are nine and 10 year old kids. Right. And across the country, they're, they're education studies that talk about this, where uh, black kids are the first ones that get recess taken away. Black kids are the first ones that have nature time limited. And so, again, you're thinking about a generation, my generation, and now this even some Gen Xers that are graduating, having a whole K through 12 experience where they may not have never even had the chance to go to a state park, a whole K through 12 experience where they never even had a chance to get hands on experiential learning in nature. Right. And again, I'm not trying to knock some of the amazing work that some uh, educators are doing here in our city, um, but we still have to keep pushing and think holistically about the development of, of kids in our community, specifically when we're thinking about black kids and what opportunities they don't have equal access to. And so like I was thinking, um, the, re the research says that when schools, when K through 12 schools decrease recess time and free play time, that it doesn't have a positive impact right. on, on test scores. Right. right. When you think about young children, like physical activity is, is necessary for adequate brain development and learning. And so like the, these are things that we need to think critically about in terms of the way that we educate our children in terms of the, the benefits, their academic benefits. And I, I think that's a great way to pitch it to school administrators. and leaders. Well, you wouldn't withhold lunch as a discipline. You wouldn't say like, well, you were talking in class, so we're not going to feed you today. And so it's a health issue. Or like, well, I would send him to the nurse, but he's been really bad. So we're not going to send him to the nurse when he's running a fever. It's we think of it as we really do think of the outdoors as it, or being outside or playing or physical activity as a hobby or a luxury when really it is a a critical piece of how our bodies were designed. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. I mean, one thing with Black Outside to just uh, shadow the amazing work that our team has done, our volunteers has done, uh, done our board has done. And, you know, when we started our work, I said there should be we for one. Our firm belief is that nature is a human right. Right. It, like it, kids have a right to nature. They have a right to have breathe fresh air. They have a right to access to nature spaces. Right. And with that, we just don't believe there should be any barrier to a kid getting outside. Right. And so, you know, sometimes it's even, you know, I think about literally the backpack that's behind me. Right. That's a hundred and forty dollar backpacking backpack. Right. And so like sometimes it's like you go to these stores and you see the price and you see all these things. There's all these layers. And uh, so we're really trying to close that gap you know, as an organization and say, you know, you, you can see sleeping bags behind me. Like we're like we're gonna build out a gear library. There's not gonna be any limit for our summer camp. 
We have a sliding scale. Families pay as much as they can. And I'm not saying all this to brag about our work. I, what I am saying is like, that's the type of thinking we had to do to close these gaps. We had to say, there should be no barrier. We have to like go to Gear Library. We have to do all these things uh, to ensure our kids have equal uh, space and place in nature. That's, I think that's so funny that like, it's, it's the outdoors. It's in theory, it's free, but we've managed to like commodify it in such a, cause I mean, I'm as guilty as the next white person of really enjoying going to REI and like geeking out on camping gear. My husband is a huge camping gear head and, um, but not thinking about how we are, we're starting to mold the culture into being a little more of a commercial endeavor than a public health endeavor. Um, and that, that could change because if we considered it a public health issue, we wouldn't, we might not be as um, bougie about it. Yeah. You know, I do, I do want to uh, give a shout out to Sandra who's commented a few times and I want to get to her comments. Uh, she, she just recently just said, I appreciate what Alex is saying about pre-existing conditions for people of color. Latinos and blacks have to live in the least valued spaces and eat the least costly, least costly foods of every kind. Of course, that developed into a health and lifespan issues, dot, dot, dot. So she did post a question earlier. And thank you for that comment, Sandra. The question was, how can we help connect our black community uh, in this corona, uh, COVID-19 time? And uh, how can we contact youth uh, without IT connections? Uh, so uh, would anybody like to tackle that question? Yeah, do you want? I guess I could jump in. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's been tough. I'll name it. It's I'm not gonna paint a picture and say here's the easy one drop solution. Just figure this out, right? Um, you know, even for us, like there's been youth that we impact and mentor, and we've had to dig in and find like, okay, are they okay? Contact auntie, contact like this person, contact mom, figure it out, right? Um, and so you know, I I think. You know, the biggest thing I think kids, a lot of kids are on social media. So one thing we're trying to do is slowly make some pivots and how we even do social media and engage with youth in that way. Um, and I, I'll openly name and be transparent here. Right. There's kind of this movement where it's like just connect on Zoom with kids. Right. And like for us, it's like kind of like a tear in our heart because as Langston mentioned, we're kind of not anti totally anti screen time. But if we're going to use screens, we're going to be very intentional about it. Uh, and so we're really trying to find ways to like pivot uh, some of our programs, uh, programming to adapt. Um, but I would say like one, yeah, like it, it's, it's tough. Right. And sometimes it just takes a lot of digging and a lot of like searching and a lot of like just connecting, even like as a teacher, like you got to figure out some way to make sure the youth are okay. Um, I think the second thing is there's a, a, a good handful of really great black businesses uh, here in San Antonio, black restaurants too. And so we're trying to do a, a pivot actually starting this Saturday where we're going to start shouting them out. And we're actually going to be doing a food giveaway for one of our families each week where we'll be purchasing a food, uh, a meal, uh, for the family and then sending that to uh, uh, one of our black outside families and giving them a shout out on our Instagram page. So I think that's one small way of like, just like acknowledging the work that uh, a lot of black businesses have done in our community uh, and amplifying that because if they're able to amplify their resources, they can trickle that down to uh, their families and their community here in San Antonio. Please shout out a few now. I'm gonna yeah. get a pencil out <laughs> because- <laughs> Let me pull, pull them up. Yeah, I think uh, one great group is, um, you know, and actually they're the, one of the chefs. It's not black owned, but one of the top chefs is black is uh, Sweet Yams on the east side. They have a community oh, garden. Yeah. yeah, they're really, really awesome. Uh, another one that we're actually connecting with pretty soon here is uh, let me pull them up. Pull them up right now because we have been in contact. We've been DMing each other on Instagram. Uh, it is because I actually just heard about them. I'll be honest. Um, it is Squeezers. Squeezers is a black owned company, juice company. Uh, and, uh, they're located on the South side. They are still delivering. You can follow them on Instagram at Squeezers CO. They'll pop right up. Uh, but they, uh, offer health and wellness. And again, they're another, uh, black owned, um, they're another black owned, uh, restaurant here in our community. Um, you know, and then there's obviously some staple ones in Tony G's bibs is another one uh, that's also uh, doing great work. Um, and then Langston, what's the one that we have pizza at? Um, uh, Tank's Pizza. Tank's. Tank's Pizza is a good one. And um, Smash and Crab is a, is a great restaurant. Smash and Crab. All right. We put a few of those in the comments below. We'll continue to do that uh, throughout the evening. Um, 
I, Langston, I do want to discuss this one last time. What can we do as a community to, to better engage and flatten the curve in, in communities of color where the percentages are not nearly as high? Uh, what, are, what are some things that we can do as citizens? And, and I'll let this open up to anybody, Becca or Alex as well. So I don't, I don't want to be um, pessimistic, but I think, I think what needed to be done needed to be done a while ago, like preventative. Like yeah. we, can't, we can't wait till the epidemic hits to address the epidemic that's already been there for a while. Then and what can we do to help with any unfortunate next scenario? So I just, I, I, I think, I think this is a, this is an opportunity, um, and I don't I don't I don't say that to dismiss the you know the bad things that are going on. I think that this is an opportunity to um, to learn about how we can be intentional about alleviating many of the issues, the underlying issues that um, make COVID nineteen uh, much worse for Black communities. Uh, and I think what Alex is doing in terms of uh, making people aware of getting outside is something that's crucial. I also think uh, within Black communities, uh, here in San Antonio, it's been difficult um, to, as someone who's who's not from San Antonio, who's new, it's been difficult to connect with um, Black folk and Black institutions that have been here for a long time. And so having someone like Alex who's going out to Black businesses and other Black institutions to connect and spread information is something I think that we could do right now in order to uh, help, uh, again, decrease some of the disparities that we're having with COVID-19. But we as a community or, or as groups of communities, Black communities here in San Antonio have to be intentional about connecting with each other um, individually, but also as institutions. And I think that this is a great opportunity and a great time for us to start thinking about where our common interests are so that we can have these uh, protective social barriers in our community that protect us um, from the next potential disaster. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I do wanna get us a few comments here. These are comments, not questions, but Tiffany O'Neill says, uh, thank you for the comments that you said earlier. And, Reese, and she said, recess is vital uh, for learning. So uh, thank you for that comment. I totally agree with that. Uh, Barbara Calvin says, I believe the lack of physical activity during school hours is a strong component of a lack of public school funding. Is there a disparity between uh, public and private charter schools when it comes to exercise? I'm gonna bring Becca back in here because she is an education reporter and I think she'll have something to say and we'll leave it open to the rest of y'all. Um, I think I've seen a variety of charters and traditional district schools doing a poor and good job. There's, I've seen um, both sectors, uh, almost even different schools within the same district doing a different um, uh, embracing recess and its learning potential or outdoor education, you know, um, the Montessori, public Montessori schools are gonna bring a different level of outdoor engagement and whatnot. So um, I would say that um, it it differs school to school. Um, one thing that I would like to see happen um, in the school district where my children are, which is San Antonio ISD, um, is two recesses per day. My kids are little, um, and so I, you know, we're definitely advocating for at least two recess, two thirty minute recesses per day. If you know, if they can't do a full hour or whatever. But I, I don't think it's a sector thing. Yeah, I would agree there. I, I've seen great charter schools that do amazing work thinking comprehensively about this and ones that don't. And similarly, like traditional public schools that do a great job and some that don't. Um, I, I would actually push and say, hmm, I don't necessarily know if it's necessarily whittled down to like just funding is the gap. I think, I mean, it starts with like vision, like the vision of school leaders. If like, it's not part of your vision to think critically about how much outdoor time your kids have, then it's just going to fall by the wayside, right? So I think that's the first thing. And I think, secondly, I think it's a, 
I actually think there's a networking gap that's exists at least here in San Antonio, where sometimes I hear about, I'm like, whoa, the way that camp's free, like that free outdoor science camp. And then I talk to school leaders, they're like, we had no idea that exists. And I think there's a huge disconnect and there needs to be some more network weaving, as I say, around like, hey, like this community partners actually offers, you know, I know like SAWS offers a whole comprehensive water studies program, right? And they partner with some schools on the West side that I know about to do that, right? And so that's one example where like some school leaders may have no idea that even exists. They may want to do it, but they don't know where to start from the resource uh, piece. Because if it's like, the center are the Whitty Museums, another example, they have a comprehensive nature science program that they offer too. So there's a lot of resource in our community, but I think for some reason right now, especially for some of our urban schools, there's a disconnect of like, here are the resources available and here's what we have and like trying to like build that bridge between the two. I think that a lot of, oh, sorry, Langston, were you going to say something? Yeah, yeah I, I do. I do. Uh, just, just, you know, one, one of the conversations uh, I've been having with the community of scholars and researchers that I know who are, phys who are in physical education, teacher education, is that we just need to start our own school. Like those of us who are public health academics and physical education academics, like we need to get out of the ivory tower and just found a school that is focused on like the complete comprehensive health of our students and then use that as a model to um, show that you can provide um, a healthy, physically active environment while also having academic excellence. And I think schools become so narrowly focused on the academic piece that they leave out the other aspects of the children's lives and um, negate the fact that physical activity is, again, a part of uh, our children's development. I don't see anybody um, talking about the lack of physical activity when it comes to Black kids playing sports. Because if it's football, if it's track and field, and it's basketball, there's all of this support, all of this rallying, all these resources from parents and administrators um, and the community at large. But if we were going to put in a comprehensive physical activity program or put in an outdoors program, I don't think um, the school or the, the community surrounding the school would be as enthusiastic about that as it would be um, as they would be like a football game. And the what the students that sports serves is a very small percentage of the students that go to school to begin with. And so we need to make some shifts in thinking about what's best long-term uh, for our children and our communities uh, as we think about the schooling practices. I have a, can I follow up on that? Sure. Um, this, when you say, when I hear that, it's so true. Um, obviously, but it immediately makes me think that we're not willing, we're willing to invest in the physical activity of black youth, um, but not for their own enrichment, not for, um, when you go outside, it's a very personal, you're the, you're the primary beneficiary. And so it seems almost, it almost highlights some of the exploitation that happens in sports, um, to, when you talk about how that's not valued across the board, all the things that we say we value about sports, oh, physical activity and teamwork, all of those things are equally true about the outdoors and camping and working together to, you know, set up a tent or whatever. But um, the primary beneficiary changes. Do you, I'm, I'm guessing you have thoughts on that. Anybody? So, yeah, I, I, you know, sports, sports in many ways is um, exploitative of um, black bodies, black students, particularly like at the collegiate level. Um, if we're thinking about like, you know, we got coaches making millions of dollars, or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but the student athletes don't make any money. And even from a young age, like going pro or getting a scholarship is a carrot that someone hangs out for, you know, black kids to make it out of the hood. Um, when there's all of these other things that black children could be doing um, to enrich their communities, enrich themselves and their families other than sport. And I look at like what Alex is doing, right? What if, what if we presented to children the opportunity to start a nonprofit at a young age, right? And within their communities, develop things that um, not only enrich themselves, but everyone else. And that's something that looks really good on a college application. Like you've already started building something of your own rather than going into a situation where 
um, you know, your outdoor life or your physical, phys the physically active aspect of who you are is only valued for what you can do on a track, on a court, or on a field. Yeah. Uh I do, I do real fast want to reintroduce everybody. If you're just now joining us, uh, Pup Theology here online, we've been doing this uh, every week now uh, through Facebook Live and through YouTube. And right now I'm with uh, Professor Langston Clark from UTSA, and we're interviewing Alex Bailey from Black Outside Incorporated, a great organization that connects uh, people to the outdoors and finds racial reconciliation through place and nature. Uh, I, I think that's wonderful. And we're with uh, reporter Becca McNeil. She's an, er an education reporter in her own right, uh, previous with the Revive Report and does her own blog about education. She's also the immigration reporter for Christianity Today and really just got a good shout out uh, online, Becca, for your work through Christianity Today. You're, you're about to join, you're about to be in a forum or, or is it already passed? Oh yeah, the Border Perspective Forum. Uh, that happened a couple days ago, or it happened uh, they, online right now. They but, you know, watch it online. Uh, watch it online. Perspective forum Christianity Today. Uh, is, it, is it linked on Christianity Today? Did they? No, it? no, no, no. This um, you can find it. Border Perspective is the ministry that led it, and you can go to their website and you fill out a form. They send you a link, and then you can access all of the um, conference material. It was a one of the in-person conferences that got moved online <laughs> okay, <laughs> as is, as we are doing now. So, um, Oh, hi, Britt. <laughs> um, real quick. I want to uh, jump to Jeanette's question about um, asking the, what if asking the community about the importance of outdoor space was considered when designing schools and preparing bond packages. And I'd like to ask Alex and Langston, what they've seen as far as the way schools are designed. Um, we talked about a little bit about urban, you know, urban environments, but schools in many ways are designed to be very um, inward focused. I'm thinking of schools that don't have windows. I'm thinking of schools where everything is focused around tiny little concrete courtyards. Um, where have you seen, have you seen any, schools that are specifically designed with outdoors and um, kinesiology in mind. Especially any non-private schools, bonus points if it's a non-private school, a public school. So I'm not sure if it's still open and it's definitely not, not a school. I, from what I saw of this school, it's called the Namaste School and it's in Chicago, Illinois. And so it, it has been very intentional about um, integrating physical activity into the school day, but I don't know so much about whether or not they actually get children to the outdoors in the sense of like putting them in nature. They're still in this, this urban environment. Um, I think there are, there are curricula uh, that are placed within certain schools that allow uh, children to get more access to outdoors. I don't know if I've seen it done um, in a lot of schools where, where there's many black children. Though. So outdoor education is something that I don't think anecdotally that black children have as much access to. Um, so I do think regardless of how the school is designed, like the physical structure, the curricular structure could change to, um, to foster more uh, outdoor education for black students, regardless of what the school design actually is. It's just a matter of integrating it into the curriculum in creative ways. Yeah, I I would agree. I think I, I can't think of a school at the top of my head that's like, at least like from the start of their vision when they built the school is like, we are building this because it's going to be like an outdoor education hub and serve like kids of color or specifically black youth, right? Um, I do think I agree with Langston, right? I definitely think there's definitely a lot of really amazing school leaders that are thinking critically about it and have like a curriculum lens on it and say, hey, just in general, we're going to have kids spend, have double the recess time or, you know, they can walk from class to class. Maybe our buildings are a little more spread out so they get a little breath of fresh air and we'll give them versus six minutes to go to class. We'll give them 10 minutes to go to class so they just get a little bit of time to relax. And I do think there are a lot of schools in our city that are doing uh, amazing work with like community gardens or gardening locally, like right there on their campus, which I think is a huge first step. And that's really, really awesome. Uh, I mean, if I were to shout out one uh, charter school um, and uh, that I, I would think is thinking about this and serves black youth is SA Prep. They're a newer uh, charter school um, and they actually called us out of nowhere and they're like, 
we want to think about how outdoor programming would look. And they're just founding their school. So um, not that any school is perfect, but it was amazing for us. And a relief for me to hear like a school's like launching and in their vision, they're like, how do we think about this uh, idea of kids having equitable access to nature in our founding vision in our first and second year of launching? So uh, I would want to shout out to that school because they're doing uh, amazing thinking around that. And the school leader though is black as well, isn't she? Yes. Yeah. She is, she is probably thinking very similarly along the lines that you're thinking. Yes. Uh, I do want to get to the question from George uh, Allen Bradley. Uh, and it's a longer question. So uh, it says this, um, is there a coalition of black organizations that is considering buying land to spearhead the rural component of black children and adults to be outside? Seems to be to me that a lot of prior racist systems have conspired to limit black folks being outside and that must be overcome in all its dimensions. So well, uh, one of y'all two just kind of take a stab at that question. Can I, can I amend that question a little bit? Minute all you want. Um, so I think I think it's important one to recognize that like this is pub theology. So it's it's a space where we talk about faith, and we haven't we haven't necessarily gotten into that aspect of it. And so um, I'm wondering what what would it look like for um, a coalition of black churches to to do that right to buy the land because churches have land, right? Churches have space, and I, I'm just assuming I'm not sure about the facts, um, but I. I some of these black churches in San Antonio probably have more land than we're we're aware of, and so I'm I'm wondering what a coalition of black churches um, doing something beyond the typical Sunday sermon, um, beyond the typical like what we call the temple model, doing something where we provide like an open space, a learning space for black folk to reconnect with the outdoors, and I think that would be awesome if they could partner with you, Alex, um, as a, as a man of faith and like. How, how does spirituality spirituality interact with what you're doing and how can black churches align themselves with what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome question. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like a huge point. I mean, you look at a lot of the private spaces in uh, here in central Texas and in the Hill country, a lot of them are owned by Christian organizations. And thankfully I, I will say like, we've been blessed when we reach out, they've been welcomed us with very open arms and they're figuring, trying to figure out, okay, we're trying to figure out this stuff in equity piece too. You know, we've had this land for 80 years. Like, what does it look like? Right. And, you know, I, so I will want to shout out to say thank you in that regard. But I do agree. It's another layer when we own our own space and be able to dictate what that space feels like and looks like. And knowing our social capital and social connections we have within our own community, then we're able to build some of those bridges to deeper outdoor experiences. So, one, it's definitely something we've thought of literally on our first board meeting. We said, hey, we have a goal in the next five years to somehow acquire land. We want to definitely begin partnering and thinking about that with black churches, too. Uh, shout out to one camp reset camp. Uh, they're actually based out of New Orleans um, and they serve predominantly black youth in their uh, faith based summer camp. Uh, and similarly, they're in the same boat as us. They're like, we are trying to buy land. Um, and I know there's a couple groups in Houston that are thinking about it. But all that being said, I do think that's like the, that will just move the needle a lot to us being able to own land. And as far as I know, unless it's like a small 10 to 15 acres, um, I don't I don't know any large scale organizations like that outside of like urban areas that have a big 40, 50, 100, 150 plus acre plot of land that's dedicated to immersion in the outdoors. And I think that's a huge piece of spiritual development, knowing that uh, in, in our faith backgrounds, we know that that God has charged us with being schooled of the earth around us. And so we've got to find a way to bridge that gap for our black community. I mean, obviously, in in churches and a whole races, I mean. Church yeah. in general, outdoor programs, have, I mean, they, they have church camps, they have church retreats, they have family camps. I mean, I'm just, I used to work for the Diocese of West Texas at, at Christ Episcopal Church. And I'm not talking about the overall Episcopal Church, just the diocese in San Antonio itself owns, it's a land in, in Colorado. They have a beach camp for families uh, in Port Aransas or in Mustang Island. Uh, they have their own summer camp uh, near Kerrville. Um, and that's just this conference, right? I mean, it's not even, I mean, if you think nationally what the Episcopal church or the Methodist church owns, it's all over the place. Uh, and I know that that Episcopal church, uh, conference that owns that land in, uh, Colorado is desperately trying to figure out how to use it year round, how to use it more regularly during the summer, because they can't fill it with just, uh, their normal parishioners. Right. So 
not even owning land, there's ways to probably use current lands and facilities owned by these larger entities that can be used uh, to get more people in the outdoors and different places in different communities of color that are not going to have those opportunities uh, quite yet. Yeah, and I, I agree. And actually, it's ironic. We've uh, we're actually in talks with them about some potential programming for summer twenty twenty one in their Colorado facility Good. In, in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, but you know, I mean, honestly, if I were to be transparent and add though, I I'd still say yeah, we're definitely like th thinking about who are we partnering with, having deep partnerships for outdoor programming. Uh, there's just a lot of foundations that have reached out to us, which is great. It's really good. Um, but I would also say, I mean, there's just something different here in the context of Texas around us owning our own land. Like what I've never been on a trail, at least here in Texas, that's named after a black person. You know, mm -hmm. I've never been on a, in a, like I've seen a cabin that's named after a black person, right? It may be somewhere. They, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. They might exist. Somebody might shout it out in the comments, but I say that to say like, it's rare that when I come to an outdoor space and place, I see something that looks like me. I see Harriet Tubman. I see images. I see Frederick Douglass. I see, you know, prominent black people that spent time in the outdoors are just images that look and feel like our kids. And so that's one of the things we think about with land ownership very critically is like, if we have this land, what's it going to look like and feel like? Because a lot of the land as great and beautiful as it is, it's not named after people that look like the kids that we serve. And I think that makes a huge difference for them wanting and seeing themselves in the outdoors. Yeah. You know, I grew up going to a camp uh, many different camps. I went to church camps that were owned by my my church or, or they just rented them out, you know, little day camps. Uh, but I went to a privatized camp called Canacuck. It's one of the largest Christian camps in, in near Branson, Missouri. And, I've heard uh, of it, actually. Yeah, and it's a privatized camp. You pay to go. The facilities are wonderful. If you have the resources, uh, you pay. Um, then they own about six other camps, and now it's, it's in, in their separate camps called Kids Across America, and I don't know if you've heard about that program before. Uh, it was a separate thing. They, they had the same core style of camp. They almost look identical, but they were separate uh, camps uh, that you're a scholarship to that usually that people, uh, instead of like going individually, you'd go with the group uh, to different terms and they fully separated it. So Canica and Kids Across America are fully separated. Uh, and many of the Young Life camps I w went to or I was even part of as a leader, there were regular camps and then what we called urban camps, right? It was like slang term for, oh, it's a totally different thing, right? Uh, where in this camping environment is that type of uh, separation healthy or is it very unhealthy or is it a blend or is it a mixed bag? Because usually I see these things completely separate, right? And for, that bothers me, but also could be a very healthy thing. So I, I, I kind of want to ask that question because it's bothered me for like 20 years. So I, I just I think back to like my, my church experience growing up. Um, I went to uh, the first Baptist church in Lincoln Gardens in Somerset, New Jersey. I know that's a long name, but I got to give my church a shout out. And one of the things that, that we did every year uh, for children of all ages was we didn't go camping, but we went skiing. Right. And skiing is, is in a lot of ways still some connection with the outdoors because you're on a mountain, you're outside, you're engaging in a physical activity that you don't typically see other black people doing. And although we weren't necessarily interacting with everybody else who was up there on the mountain, I think the benefit of that was seeing like some other black person um, on the slopes or some other black person on the slopes on a snowboard, because that's not something that I typically see. So I think it depends on what what the goal or the objective is for the um, outdoor activity. If that outdoor activity is to provide a space um, where there's this cross-cultural sort of uh, multi-ethnic uh, dialogue coming together, enjoying, having a good time, like I think that that's great to have a more integrated space. But if it's like your first time exposure, I wouldn't want to be the only black person on the mountain skiing. Like, I wouldn't want to be the only black person in the woods with a whole bunch of white people, right? Because every horror movie that we've ever seen up until like 1999 or when Scream came out or something like that, you know, the black people were the first person to die in the woods. Or if we look at like history, uh, the movie Rosewood, which is a historical movie, but it's also like horror. Like when you see black people outside, they're hanging from trees. And so there, there's some of this historical memory that we have to deal with and wrestle with. Um, but I, I think it just depends on what the goal or the objective is and being very intentional about how you structure um, structure the outdoor environment from like a, a curriculum standpoint. 
Sure. Yeah. And I would imagine, yeah, uh, I want Alex to speak on this. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, you're preaching, they're literally preaching to kind of what uh, I think about. And so I don't know if he's on the comments, but I do want to shout out Greg Hunter of uh, the Christian Camp Association, Triple CA. Uh, he's yeah. actually the president and he's actually really thinking critically about this. I mean, literally to the point he's calling my phone. He's like, I just want your voice and opinion on this. So one quick contextual piece around summer camp for me. Y'all should know. I don't even know if I have former campers watching this, but my first experience working at summer camp was a predominantly white camp. I had the best experience of my life. Literally, I'm still in contact with some of those campers. I love my experience, right? But even when I was there as a young black male, as much as I love the camp and I still like rock the material and I still have my sweatshirt to this day, I don't know to what extent uh, was the programming catered like, like Langston talks about for if we had a cohort of black kids there. Right. And so I think, again, what, with what Langston talked about is it depends on the objectives. If your objective is, hey, some form of reconciliation, uh, cross cultural dialogue, then I think yes. But if it's just like, hey, just to have a check check of diversity on our camp, we're going to bring in these 10 kids from the east side of X community. And we're not thinking about, wait a second, we don't have any counselors that look like these kids. We don't have any programming that looks like these kids. Right. I always share this quick story, this quick anecdote. Uh, is that for me, I went to a predominantly white elementary school. Again, love my experience. There are definitely some some gaps there. I had great friends. But uh, when I was growing up, every time I would pull out my hairbrush to brush my hair, a kid would say to me, and they didn't know any better. They're eight or nine. They would say, why do you br why are you brushing your hair? You don't have any hair. And so you're, when you're nine years old and you're hearing that from a classmate of people that look like you, a class of people that don't look like you, you know, you automatically get, automatically get embarrassed. And so I ended up putting my brush away. And for years, I would only like brush my hair really quickly before I went to school and I would like hide my brush. Right. And that's what I mean. Like, that's an experience for me where like for years, I didn't pull out my brush in front of people that didn't look like me because I'm like, I don't want to hear any comments. I don't want to hear any reactions. Right. And so I, I just say that to say that's one thing to think about is like, are, are these leaders thinking critically about that before they bring in black kids? Are they thinking about a young black girl's hair? Are they thinking about how she might need extra time in the morning to get ready for that, right? Are they thinking about what swimming might mean for black youth, right? And so if we're not thinking about those questions and what your staff looks like, are you ready to, to bring in diversity? And I, I think, like you said, there should be some separate programming before we just like throw kids in. No, that's great. And, and, and also a lot of issues in, Theologically, with Canacuck and Kids Across America, what I do respect them early on, they were one of the camps to give complete ownership. Like Kids Across America owned that land, and then they owned actually just about as many camp land properties now as Canacuck. So they've done a good job with ownership and allowing that to materialize. Now we could probably find things that uh, were pretty racist of why they did certain things, like any past, right? But I think uh, there are good groups really considering this. Um, you know, when I was at, at Young Life in Waco, I was at Conley High School, and I mentioned this to you all yesterday, uh, it was about 30, 30, 33 split between the black community, the white community, and Latino community. I mean, it was completely like almost split, you know, 30% in each. And um, that made it really difficult to pick a camp for our summer camp because we were labeled an urban school, right? Uh, and we were torn if we went to the traditional camp where a lot of the other the Waco schools went to, especially the, the richer parts of Waco would go to Colorado. They'd go to these camps. That's 90, probably 5% white. And our kids would say, well, we loved it, but we also felt extremely uncomfortable. But then we would go to an urban camp, right? Where the predominantly was probably African-American by 90%. And some of our other students, whether they were Latino or white, who were also poor in this urban environment felt uncomfortable. We always felt we didn't fit. Like we could never find a space because it was always one or the other. Like you, there wasn't this other alternative. So I really think it depends on the complete environment of what a student needs, right? And what a, what a youth needs, looking not only at, at race, but economic background, education, and how to make them feel comfortable in the space to grow and to learn. Um, so I, I, I kind of wrestle, wrestle with that, right? Um, sure. Because <laughs> in a lot of ways, I grew up. I grew up like Alex. Um, uh, at first, I went to like you know mostly white schools, and then um, from the end of elementary school through high school, I went through like a very diverse community um, with, with with a great schooling experience. But if you looked at it, you would say it was white, but it, it was really diverse. Um, 
And I, I look back on some of the experiences that I've had um, that have been both positive and negative. And I wasn't like always in the most comfortable space, um, but I learned how to deal with being in uncomfortable spaces by having those experiences as a young child. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have parents who could explain some of the things that were going on being the only black child in school. Um, and it, it wasn't always like the most pleasant experience. There were definitely some things I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, want to put my children through. Uh, but at the same time, like, Part of like going outdoors and being outdoors, part of like an adventure education or an outdoor education is doing things that make you uncomfortable. And so I think we just have to find ways to make children feel uncomfortable, feel comfortable with being uncomfortable, but not not experiencing, um, you know, microaggressions or, or, or things like that. Um, but being in environments that are different prepare you for you know, what it means to be an adult. Yeah, I'll just add some really quickly to that. I, yeah, I agree. I think in some we grapple with black outside, but our, where we see our foothold in the outdoor space is think about Maslow's hierarchy and needs. The first part is safety, right? And so if in some of these spaces, our kids don't feel safe from a cultural or social sense, then we need to kind of break that down a little bit. And that's what we see ourselves as just an entry point. And our hope is that like kids go on to different environments because, you know, the big piece I, I always emphasize too is I think it's super important. Uh, kids have the skill, no matter what race, to cross lines of difference. That's like very important to navigate whatever workspace city that they're in, especially as our economy and our country become more diverse and globalized. So, um, you know, I, I agree with Langston, like that's a critical skill, but I do think it also falls on leadership, right, to ensure that it's a safe space for everyone, first off, and that they're creating these uh, intentional spaces where there might be discomfort, but they have the tools and the dialogue to work through that. If there's two resources, really quickly to shout out, people are thinking about this as program leaders. I know Mosaic Project in California does this really, really well. Uh, and then there's another group called Live Oak Camp in New Orleans uh, that had, literally has kids from suburban New Orleans and urban New Orleans, and they come together for summer camp. So there's definitely groups that are already doing this. Yeah, and I want to bring that back in. Uh, we have a, a, a question slash comment. I think if I read this right, uh, George is thinking about historically back colleges and universities like Hudson Tillerson University is a Methodist connected university that might have some connections. Wiley, Purdue, A&M, maybe resources here have uh, what are the connections with those HBCU universities? Like, yeah, you want me to? I'll jump in. I'll give a shout out to yeah. Aggie Pride, uh, Langston's alumna, uh, alumna school. So they actually just started a program called HBCU Outside. You can follow it on Instagram. Uh, I haven't. We keep playing like a phone circus around the the uh, founder of that, but his name's Ron Griswell. Uh, he's an alum at North Carolina a and and he started a whole comprehensive program uh, alongside some even outdoor brands where they're starting to create like outdoor programming at the HBCU level. Um, and so us for Black Outside, I always tell people, sometimes people bring us ideas. I'm like, yes, that's a great idea. I was like, we're also one years old. So like, you got to give us a little time to figure it out. But we do. Uh, I know Hudson Tilson has like one of the uh, a great comprehensive environmental science program. So that's a great start. So uh, you know, we really do want to have deeper connections with HBCUs in the coming years as we build out this beautiful vision for Black Outside uh, and with other groups in partnership with potentially some of these other outdoor spaces to say, actually, here's a cohort of kids that have uh, of youth 1920 that have outdoor experiences already. Hey, you have job opportunities. Let's connect them. So then other kids of other races are seeing Black people doing this, too, so they can break those stereotypes in their mind also. Well, thanks for that. Uh, you know. Here's a, here's a funny story. I don't know if I should say it or not, but when I was in training for this, this high school uh, at in Conley High School in, in your Waco, I went to an urban planning, like young life retreat. And the leaders who were predominantly African-American said, you know, guys, y'all should probably do skits that are really relative uh, to your students. So like make a skit about your mom, right? Make like, like a mama jokes. And I remember thinking, none of my students are going to find my mom funny. Like that's the worst idea I've ever heard because uh, they're, if I give a skit about my mom uh, to these students, they're just going to stare at me. Uh, and I remember thinking not only is there a disconnect between sometimes leaders that are leading these different groups, right? Because all of them are going to connect different ways to the students. So how do certain leaders still connect with historically communities of color and still have to, uh, you know, be a part of that, you know, I, don't, I hope that makes sense. But I remember thinking that very vividly thinking that's not going to work well if I do a skit about my mom. Right. Um, 
Uh, I just remember thinking that very early on and saying, I'm, I'm probably not going to do that. So Becca, we're going to bring you back in. Uh, your mic, your mic is, is on you. I'll try to unmute you. You might have to do it yourself. There we go. Got it. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that I can, t- and kind of going back to the ownership issue, but also the, the idea of partnering with institutions and whatnot is that the idea of giving underprivileged kids a chance to experience something cool has um, a little bit of a twisty history. And I don't think anybody wants to feel like they're the, um, like the charity case, but at the same time, that is very much how land owning organizations and whatnot often get into the work. Hopefully they can, they evolve and realize that there are missing pieces of that conversation, but talk to me a little bit about how, about creating that sense of entitled, like you have a right to be out here. We have a right to be outside. And this is not something that um, necessarily someone gifted you because it's their right and you're getting to borrow it. But talk to, talk a little bit about instilling that sense. How do you talk to the kids, Alex, to in, remind them or maybe be the first person to ever like explicitly have that conversation with that language about um, the fact that they belong in spaces that are, are terribly white usually in their experience, but then also the reality that there is some, um, I know that there are schools that try to invest in outdoor experiences for students because they know that when they're interviewing for jobs and whatnot, the person interviewing them may have a common interest there. And so I know like Cass Tech and a lot of the schools in Northeast invest in outdoor education because they want kids to have that vocabulary and that common experience because it helps you kind of like, you know, banter with folks when you get into a workplace um, because there's just a whole set of experiences that privilege affords. So talk, I, I'm that it's kind of a windy two part question, but I'm wondering how you talk to kids about the intersection of privilege and outdoors. Yeah, so to build off that first kind of point, and it kind of ties a little bit to Gavin's story, Uh right, is like, I think one push that I even make at the higher level, sometimes with organizations like going through like, we're going to help underprivileged youth, right? Is that like, uh, which has a lot of connotations. There's a lot, there's a lot. There's a lot there that we can unpack. I see Langston taking his head. He's like, yes. (laughs) But, um, But there's a quote that says, stop creating stuff for us without us. Right. Oh, yeah. and so one of my big pushes, even in outdoor education world is like sometimes it's like we're going to create this program for this demographic. You're not even just black youth, but maybe it's Latinx youth. Maybe it's, you know, undocumented youth. Maybe it's whatever, like demographic marker. And it's like, well, wait a second. No one's who's planning this programming. If it's like very comprehensive. Right. It's like looks like these kids are is from that community. And sometimes it's like, well, we don't know anyone who has the outdoor experience. And it's like, well, you know, they may not necessarily have to have the outdoor experience. What if you were to just bring someone in or at least have a voice or feedback to these ideas? Right. Um, Whether it's a student or anything who just can bring have an outside perspective. So I think that's one big push on the top that I think is important is like who is making these decisions? Who is crafting programming? Are you having inclusive voices in that? Um, I think the the second piece of your question, yeah, like that's great. I think uh, in terms of our programs, I think our summer camp does a great job of this because our history, like literally my shirt right now, has a list of black black women in the outdoors and in oh. our received this in uh, during their fall retreat, right? And so we always name to them that one. I think the key piece is that they know that they have a uh, a history right in the outdoors. And that, again, it's a right. And it's not even just a class thing. And, and here's one message I think that's super important too, even along those lines that I said to a, a summer camp that I won't name on here is they were like, oh, well, it's like, you know, we have scholarships. We have scholarships. And I was like, that's really great. I was like, there are some black families that can afford camp that are not going to send their kids to your camp. 
right. because they log onto your website and they don't see, and it's not a knock against you, but scroll down the website. They don't see anyone that looks like their girl or like their young daughter or their young son or whatever that looks like them. So why would they feel safe doing that? Right. And so I, I think there's a piece around one. Yes, we have those conversations, especially with our girls, like, cause we have them for a week around y'all have been here before the founder was here before she had land. Like it's, it's not a, like, it's, it's something that's ingrained in you. Um, and then I think the second piece is, you know, on the grass kind of like tops, I would say is like, we're trying to push like leaders in the outdoor to say, Hey, like, make sure you're inclusive with thinking about your programming, who's giving you feedback around your programming. So when you do serve that population of kids and I, I get, it's also messy work. Right. And so if that's just the entry point and it starts off really messy, right. You know, it may start there, but I think the key thing is what are you learning and are you setting up the reflective practices to say, okay, we had this group of kids to start off. Here's what went right. Here's what went wrong. Maybe let's bring in someone from the boys club, boys and girls club. Maybe let's bring someone from the school. Maybe we bring in a parent or something to give us some feedback on programming for the next year. Um, so I think the intentions there, right? I think there just needs to be more comprehensive thought. And I think when we talk to our kids, kind of going back to Gavin, it's like, what messages are we also sending them to say, are the people that look like them have been here before in our brochures and our material is it representative of our kids uh, are we even in skits about the history are we bringing in potentially black and brown figures versus like typical figures that we care about in the outdoors right um, yeah thanks Dan. so I'm, I'm wondering um well i think a lot of times we have conversations about about race um or uh, or about black folk is it's always um, oftentimes in the binary of black folk and white folk and how uh, white folk may have more privilege than black folk or what have you. But I, I'm starting to think about when, when we talk about privilege, I think maybe some of the, we need to start having conversations about what it means to be black and privileged with black children mm -hmm. um, and how like there are communities of black folk that like go on their own camping trips, that go on their own skiing trips, that um, you know play tennis together, that golf together. Uh, but generally speaking, like uh, other black folk, whether you even middle class black folk don't have exposure to um, some of these isolated networks of black people here in the United States. Uh, but we need to see those examples of black folk who have long histories of being middle class and upper middle class and sort of insulating themselves um, away from black people who are poor or uh, below middle class or um, even black folk who are new to the United States, uh, recent immigrants and children of immigrants don't have exposure to that. And so I I'm interested to think about or, or even, um, you know, begin to talk about how do, how do we get those examples that do exist to connect with other black folk who maybe have the resources or even don't have the resources to get connected to these green spaces and become a part of those social networks and, and gain more social capital through the outdoors. Yeah, and if I could just add one quick thing, I mean, I know I've been shouting out a lot of uh, pieces here, but like, that's what makes, I, I think our Camp Founder Girls community when we started off so beautiful is like, we were very intentional about that sliding scale because I didn't, we didn't want to come in and assume that like, oh, well, it's only going to be like this like class of people. We have families that like wrote the check. We're like, here it is. Here's some extra money. Make sure the girls, like other girls that may not afford the opportunity uh, can come to this camp also. And so, uh, and even for this upcoming summer, we literally had four families that enrolled that paid the max amount in which we named. If you pay the max amount, you're contributing to another camper being able to come. And they were willing to write that check, right? Um, and two families were actually supposed to fly in, one from Massachusetts and one from Seattle, right? To come to attend camp for that opportunity. And so uh, I will say like, I do think to add to Langston's point, right? There's like definitely some class that goes in. And I think uh, one piece that gets kind of mixed in is people assume like everyone that's black is the same. It's very monolithic. And like, even at our camp, you know, we had girls that came from the Northeast, uh, Northeast ISD, the Northeast side of town, and some that came from the West side, some that came from the East side. They had vastly different cultural experiences in San Antonio, right? And they were able to work together, right? But there was a little piece where like, you kind of talk different, you kind of act different, you kind of wearing different clothes, right? Uh, and they got to see that black is like, there's a, a, black isn't one thing. There's like a spectrum to being black. It's like not one way to be black. There's different identities and different ways of be, being black and operating in our world and specifically the United States. I think that's all, uh, that's, I've had that conversation with a lot of my Latinx friends as well 
about um, how, especially in San Antonio, um, with such a large Hispanic comp, uh, population, how class really, really shapes um, where schools and neighborhoods and all of that. And um, they don't deal with quite as much of the being the only one in the room as a lot of black people have more of that experience in San Antonio than Hispanic people. Um, but that I think that overlapping class and then it, it then leads me when we're talking back about like the land access issue, how you see that it's much, much more, you start to bump into some areas that are about much more than, um, economic mobility, you start to bump into a few more structural issues um, that, you know, and we've talked, privilege is, is about a lot more than what you can afford and, you know, being able to afford things. It's also about like where you're allowed to be. And I think it's so helpful that you guys have brought in that history of like where black people were and were not allowed to be, because there's also legal, social, structural things that you couldn't, um, necessarily um, improve your way out of or, you know, earn your way out of even. And so I think that the outdoors, when you talk about the reconciliation aspect of it, um, you're getting at something much, much deeper than who could afford to go to summer camp even in some ways. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's a huge historical context. I would push people if you want like some reading on this, uh, Black Faces, White Spaces uh, by Dr. Caroline Finney. She has literally a whole book that talks about Black people's history and nature in the context of the United States. And it's really powerful work. So if that's like some reading you want to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's true. And I, I share this little quick anecdote with uh, sometimes colleagues who have a little bit divergent thinking on that. And I say, you like my grandfather, who's not that, who I remember, he passed away, God rest his soul, right? Is like, he literally came back from World War II, was a World War II veteran and could not purchase a home in certain areas of Mansfield, Ohio. Right. And so it wasn't that it's not that far fetched. I remember my grandfather. I grew up with my grandfather. He lived till I was 22. And like sometimes people think, you know, and you probably can echo this. People think, oh, racism is so far away. I was like, that's literally a generation that impacted where my grandfather lived, where my mom grew up, what schools they could go to. Right. And thankfully, you know, Mansfield, Ohio is a pretty small town. So there was a lot more, a little bit more access and people were working across lines of difference a little bit earlier than other parts of the country there. But still, I mean, think about that. That's like one microcosm. But that happens in Chicago, that happened in Milwaukee, that happened in L.A., that happened in parts of Texas here. Right. And then you amplify that with like the idea that, again, like we like Maddie Landry, she couldn't even get her girls to camp. Now, one powerful piece around Maddie Landry's history that I did want to name is she actually did buy land, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, and so her husband, her husband uh, was biracial. And so he passed for white and he was able to buy land in Bernie, Texas. Uh, and so they had land for 30 plus years, uh, but it's because her husband, she had that that social capital with her husband to be able to purchase land. Um, and um, yeah, and so we think about that even piece of history, even with the work that we do and why we even want to press forward a lot with ensuring we get land again and kind of have that reconciliation with just the energy of the earth and the land around us in the context of Texas, uh, since we had it in the past. So I, I love the idea and I really want to focus Focus on this to the last few minutes that we're here. Uh, if you again, if you're listening or uh, you're watching somehow, uh, uh, you can ask us questions. We'll spend the next 20 minutes here discussing our conclusions and uh, but post your comments on below. We'll, we'll pull that up uh, and, and ask that so we don't want to miss out on that. Um, when I think about reconciliation in, in the outdoors, I also think of the idea of Sabbath, right? Like the Sabbath in a lot of historical places and religious circles, uh, the Sabbath was a day of rest, but a, re a reconnection to the earth around you. It wasn't just like, oh, I can sleep all day. It's my Sabbath. Like it was supposed to reconnect you with the, God's creation and, and reconnect you with nature. So speaking spiritually, uh, how can we, how can we, I, I, I'm blanking on my question now, but how can we continue pressing this theological idea in, in these, in these programs without really crossing boundaries of, of 
religious like freedoms and, and interference with other people's belief systems in this kind of pluralistic world? How can we still reclaim the Sabbath and make it appropriate for all people? Right. I think that's the question I was going for. That's why Becca does this more than me. It's my job. Yeah. So I just, for me, and I, I'm not, I'm not, again, it, it's, I don't want to make black people um, monolithic, not by any stretch of imagination, but, um, you know, the research shows that in the United States, um, the people who believe in God the most is, you know, is black people, right? There, there are more of us who are believers percentage wise um, than most other demographics. And so um, for many black people, not all black folk, um, spirituality plays a huge part in, um, in our lives. And so I, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, uh, to negate uh, in, in, in conversations or in a way that we try to reconnect with nature that, that, you know, the earth is a gift from God to us, right? And even when it comes to stewardship of the earth and our connection to um, the environmental movement and things like that is something that I think, uh, depending on who, who you're working with culturally, that is something that should be uh, in many ways central to the outdoor experience for, um, for black folk, black children. Uh, and I'm, I'm reading this devotional, it's not really a devotional, but it's um, Meditations of the Heart by Howard Thurman. And he's a, a theologian who actually, I think was one of Martin Luther King's professors at Boston University. And when I was looking up some of his background, it said when he was a child that he used to talk to trees. And so um, that just, I, I think in his approach and his understanding of the world and theology was like having connection with God um, through not only his Bible, but through the world around him is something that um, all of us could embrace. I want to read that now. <laughs> yeah, Howard Thurman's amazing. He, he's also yeah. the author of one of my favorite books, Jesus and the Disinherited. It's an amazing book. Uh, uh, we should read all of his books, really. So, Alex, any thoughts about uh, the Sabbath? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I kind of have a unique angle on this is that um, I think we have to think critically about the entry points when we uh, bring in communities of color to different spaces, especially in the outdoors, right? Uh, Tara Yoso has an amazing work where she uh, talked about this idea uh, for especially communities of color. We have these capitals that exist. She talks about navigational capital, uh, aspirational capital, uh, and familial capital. And she names these examples. If you're an educator, you would really, really like geek out over it. It's really interesting. And one of the pieces that we, that I think about with these entry points, right, is like the spiritual capital that a lot of our communities bring in as, as Langston mentioned. And so with that, I think there's this like idea in the outdoor industry where it's like, we can get these kids to like come if we have this awesome water studies program, awesome birding activity, awesome environmental education. And I've been pushing to say, well, what if actually our first entry point was like social, emotional, or like a deeper kind of spiritual, with not like a faith practice, but like a spiritual piece of that entry point. Our first experience with kids was like that we had, we didn't say, hey, you're gonna come out here, you're gonna look at birds and identify everything. It was like, actually, you're gonna come here. You guys are seniors in high school. This is an opportunity for y'all to reflect, right? Take a step back and reflect on your journey, your K through 12 journey. Right. And so I think like emphasizing that as an entry point, that nature is an opportune place where you can get away and reflect and, and think and rest your mind, body and soul uh, and have a deeper connection with the world around you. Uh, because you're right, that concept of Sabbath is so important uh, from a faith based background, from tons of figures where the first place they went is the outdoors to recoup and regenerate their mind. Right. And so we try to do that with youth without explicitly um, without especially like bringing in the faith component, but say, let's build out time during outdoor activity to say, we're gonna get to the top of this hike. Let's stop for 10 minutes, uh, give you some silent time to just reflect on your own, whatever that looks like. If that's praying for you, if that's meditating, if that's just like sitting silently, but give that time and just like hear, listen to the birds, listen to the world around you and think about what that feels like. And if we can start having those connections and those neurons start connecting later, it's like now our kids are starting to say, I had a kid that I mentor who went on a trip and he was like, man, I'm 
I'm really stressed out. I'm anxious right now because I've been in the house all the time with uh, COVID-19. And I said, well, have you been outside yet? He's like, oh my gosh, yes. And literally he posted a video on his Instagram of him walking just around his neighborhood. And he's like, I just feel so much better taking this time outside uh, to reflect a little bit. So that's an example there of doing that. No, and I want to pull up a comment. And I just realized we can actually pull up comments uh, to show people. So I'm, this is the first time I'm doing it. So I hope I don't mess it up. But right here, uh, to, and I hope we get it all. Um, Barbara Calvin, look at that, says, to reframe the concept of Sabbath to include everyone, you'll have to address the historical use of faith to dehumanize the other. And this is great. I want Langston to respond to this. Uh, theology has never been universally inclusive. So when we, when we talk about this, we do have to think about how historically uh, it's often used, especially uh, the Sabbath in, in religious places have been used to exclude not to include. So how do we, thank you, Barbara Calvin, for that comment. How do we, um, what would your response be, Langston? So I, uh, I, I want to thank Barbara too. Uh, I, I'm just, man, I, I'm thinking about this reconciliation piece and it's what, I, I'm wondering what responsibility do um, the white religious institutions have in going back and unpacking like their racist history, right? What, what officials in San Antonio went to whatever historic white church in San Antonio that exists now um, who, who may have put up racist policies and what responsibility does that institution have to, you know, fixing the wrongs that were done in the past and how, how, what role do white churches have to play in, in that reconciliation? Um, that, that's something that, that, that I would love to hear um, some of the white churches address um, rather maybe even than have like the black churches or the black faith communities certainly want to be a part of that conversation. But I think in some ways white institutions should take the lead on, on, on that. That's good. So Barbara, thank again, thank you for that question. Um, uh, again, you can ask your questions. Uh, James Emerson is, is, is about to post a question. I think if he can post it online, we'll pull it up. If not, uh, we'll, we'll ask, uh, uh, we'll ask you here in a second. Uh, Becca, any thoughts uh, about what we've been talking about? Yeah, I think I love Langston's point. I'm constantly wrestling with that and needing guidance from um, whoever is offering it um, about the obligation that white folks have to interrogate our own history not for the sake of coming back and trying to like make it better, you know, and make it go away, but for just the sense of making things right. Um, not because we feel guilty or we, because we feel um, like burden, you know, the white man's burden or whatever like that, but because there's something out of alignment and it needs, we're never going to be in alignment without, justice and going back and looking through this. And so when you talk about that, I am always so eager to hear from different thinkers, um, black, white, Latinx thinkers about what is the, um, what is the impetus for that conversation? And what is, what, what is all of our role in that conversation as far as who gets to say, this is what re reconciliation looks like. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm remembering back to something you said maybe a year or two ago at Pub Theology, where you talked about um, where you talked about what it means to be a journalist and what it means to be um, a woman of faith, right? And you said that journalism is about seeking the truth. And that in a lot of ways, your spirituality is about seeking the truth. And so I think the first step is, is really like having to interrogate, um, interrogate the truth. And I don't, I don't even mean that like, I, I do mean that individually, but I, I'm thinking in terms of like institutionally, right? Yeah. Um, what, what role or responsibility does the institution have to play um, in alleviating some of those past wrongs? And being part of coalitions to sort of like even it could be something about you know increasing access to the outdoors as, as Gavin stated partnering with other churches or 
like maybe even like redefining the tie, right? What does it mean to give 10%, right? What does it mean to give 10% of the land that you own um, to alleviate some of those historical issues or 10% of that ownership to um, another institution that isn't a predominantly white institution so that they can share in the benefits of that land ownership? Um, and just pushing ideas and having conversations, but um, also being mindful of what it means to take the lead in that conversation. Um, but, but you, you know, sharing sharing some of the the responsibility with um, black institutions or other institutions to make those wrongs right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. You're right. I, I think like to add on to Langston's point, uh, to what extent there's definitely positionality, power, access, and privilege, especially for some uh, like predominantly white like religious or faith-based institutions, right? They have these power, they have access to these lands, they have access to wealth, right? Historical wealth that some of our communities may not have. And so I do agree, like the dialogue is gonna start there. And I use the word dialogue very intentionally because I think there's gonna be some positions where, yeah, like white institutions will have to lead and then other times where white institutions have to listen, right? And just hear some of these historical wrongs. I think about, you know, some of the uh, great work that's happening across the country, if you notice, on, especially on social media and Instagram, where some groups are starting to post be like, hey, this isn't just X state park. This is actually this group's ancestral land that we're hiking on, right? So let's just take a minute to acknowledge that, that like they own, they had this land for thousands of years and then all of a sudden it was taken over by colonization. Um, and I think the other piece too, to add to Langston's point is like, I think, yeah, truth seeking is super important uh, in our faith work at, as Christians, right? And so uh, in the Christian faith, and I think about like just so many times the reflective practices that even like Paul in the letters that Paul had in Galatians, and even like as you read Psalms, which has so much nature allegory in it, right? When you read those books, it's like you think about how they're doing reflective practice on like, wait a second, there's something that's like off here. I'm out of alignment with where I should be spiritually from a justice sense. How can I like think and reflect on those practices and improve? And I think systematically, we have to think about that too. And I don't think, to be honest, this is a a critique of like just our culture in America. I don't, I think we, we run away from those truths, right? Like we strive away or we try to hide it or we just like mention it once versus like confronting it, acknowledging it and having uh, some ideas on how we can, uh, how we can heal. Right. And that's what reconciliation is about. I'm almost wondering about like from, from a, from a, like a, a very Christian perspective, you know, part, part of like the, the faith system is like, you got to acknowledge your sins. Like you got to admit to your sins. Like you almost, in some ways, um, you, you got to make it plain what your truth is, whether that be bad or good. And I, I, I think that's part of that. That's part of what we do, right? What we're, what we're called to do, what we're expected to do. And I think it's interesting to, to maybe explore or think about what does that look like not as individuals, but as an institution. Like, what does it mean as an institution to acknowledge your sins? So, fun, fun overlap. I'm working on a story right now um, about Christian schools acknowledging their stuff around um, racial injustice. And um, on Northeast, West Coast, in the South, um, and I had a conversation, I've been having a lot of conversation with um, people of color, students and teachers and school leaders in those spaces. And um, today I was talking to a young white man, high school kid, and we had that conversation about, and we've kept it in this very institutional about like a progress is made better made when we get away from the personal of like, oh, am I a racist? Like do that work on your own. Um, but the progress is made when we keep it at an institutional level. And he said, he goes, he goes, it's just ironic. This is a junior in high school. He says, it's just ironic to me because we have a theology of sin. So it's weird to me that we resist so much thinking that that would impact our institutions. And I was like, I mean, it is, it's weird that we as a, as a Christian in the Christian faith, there's a theology that, to, you know, why did Jesus die on the cross? And it's because of our sins. And so it's weird though, that then we go and want to 
kind of say that there's this little part that we sin doesn't touch and this little part that no that's not that way because of anything sinful that's that way because of and it's we just um we kind of wall it off from our theology and in a way that what they'll you know what your pastor will tell you growing up is that if you're not willing to confess your sin it's hard to be reconciled and so i i'm so glad you brought that up and it it's funny it pinged for me from a conversation i literally had today with a kid at a christian school who's going through that with his school yeah that's that's super intriguing and it's just making me think yeah there's like an individual level there's a communal level and there's a systems level right and i think uh, in like a lot of christian spaces we get preached like okay god's going to give you individual grace right to what extent are we preaching a message that like yes we we've, we've made these mistakes we can correct them cuz god's going to give us the grace and leniency to do that as a system right um and so I, I think you know when we think about the systems level to what extent are we thinking about grace from a theological sense at that level too of like okay we're here where we are here's our sins of the past we have to acknowledge that we have to reconcile that part of a reconciliation process is acknowledging that god's going to give us grace in the process to step out on faith and correct some of these wrongs no and and, and we were when we were hovering around uh the idea of sabbath and reconciliation and nature uh pastor james amerson uh a great methodist pastor that's where camp found a girl started so yeah, thank you for messing with Here, he should just replace me. Um, he said this, I'm going to pull up his comment, that the year of Jubilee was the restoration of land and property. So when we talk about the year, year of Jubilee, uh, it was this Old Testament concept where uh, ever so often, I think every 50 years, is every 50 years, if I'm getting that right, uh, uh, there would be a restoration that if you were renting land, if you had debt for land, it would be given back. And so uh, people who were without privilege would then once again have the opportunity to own land and to um, continue uh, to do more. Um, and there's great books. One of my favorite Old Testament professors at Duke was Ellen Davis. She writes heavily on about land usage in the Old Testament and how to fairly um, understand land use uh, in the Old Testament, especially around things like Jubilee. So Pastor Amerson, thank you for reminding us on that. Any thoughts on the on the Jubilee and, and, and Anderson's, Amerson's comment? Yeah, I mean, I think about like that concept of like when you think about Jubilee, what are some like words? I used to do that when I was a high school teacher. Lanks and I were both high school teachers, by the way. <laughs> That's another connecting point we have. Uh, I don't know if you taught high school, but I know we were both uh, educators. So, um, yeah, like when you hear that word Jubilee, like what do you think about? What are some words that like I kind of used to do word bubbles that you associate with Jubilee? You think like very positive connotations. You think about joy. You think about happiness. Uh, and so, you know, I think like happiness is one emotion, joy is another, right? And they're definitely get, sometimes get intertwined and that's a whole different discussion. But I do think I heard uh, this uh, a really great thinker, this white woman who uh, runs a camp in Wisconsin said, she said, you know, she's trying to work through this racial reconciliation piece. And she said, I'm trying to push like white folks who look like me to take a joy. And I say joy very intentionally, not that it's going to be happy, but there's like a joy, a joyous spirit to say, I'm going to embark on this work and it's going to be hard, but I'm going to do it because it's right. And I have God's given me grace and the ability and the privilege and the access and the resources to do it. And I take joy in this opportunity to restore and reconcile what's been wrong. And she's like too many times. It's like this guilt versus this joy piece of opportunity. That's good. And, and, and now Emerson has a question. I'm going to I'm going to pop it up. He's got two questions. So uh, this question goes, uh, public housing took away green space for density population. How does this take away from the outdoors experience? So I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about New York, right? I'm not I'm, I'm 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 thinking about San Antonio. But for the purposes of this, I'm thinking about New York City and just imagine. And, and it's not just black folk, but. Imagine living in an urban environment where you don't live in a house, you live in an apartment and you have to be stuck inside, right? You don't have a backyard. You may not, um, you may not have a greenway like I do that's like right across the street for me to go to and ride my bike. Um, and I'm just like, that, that's a perfect example of it. Like in a situation like this, when you're in, um, when you're in public housing or when you're in um, an apartment situation where you don't own the land that you live in, you don't own a home, you don't own a house, you don't have a backyard, um, 
your outdoor experience is much more limited than most other people. And so I think that's something to even think about right now as we think about the mental health aspects of being stuck in the house all day. Um, it's not something that is um, ideal for anybody. Yeah. And I, I mean, just to add to that, I think like uh, which is a real thing to acknowledge in some spaces and places. Right. And I'm not saying this is every community and I'm definitely not saying this is every public housing uh, community at all. But a, re a real thing piece is like, yeah, we, we have this slab of green right here in the middle of this public housing facility that's enough right in reality what does that space feel like what does it look like let's compare that space to how it looks and feels uh in other areas um and so um you know is it over police or under police right is it like yeah does it just to what extent does it actually feel safe in those areas and i think there's a lot of layers to what safety means and connotations of that but it's something to acknowledge too when like public housing does start to take that away it impacts how people like perceive green spaces when it's just like one little slab of land without trees or you know just like one small acre versus a vast acreage of trails and trees and different um, plants and animals that uh, a lot of youth and people in urban areas may not have seen or have access to. That's good. All right. Uh, now, his second question here is, uh, what would be the next steps given the opposition of the COVID-19 pandemic touching summer? So obviously, a lot of summer activities happening. Uh, answer this question for the pastor here. Yeah, he's probably wondering, uh, and I'm so I, I'm gonna get back with you too because uh, we have Facebook Messenger chat going. Uh, but he's uh, me too. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's awesome. Man. I gave him the link to join us. So, Pastor, you can join us anytime. Bring yeah, him. sure, for sure. He's a great thinker. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, for us, we're really thinking critically about it. Our name, we don't have like one right answer. Um, you know, just to be honest, the grounding reality. My so one thing y'all should know: my full time job uh, is uh, I'm the senior director of the HEB uh, Outdoor School, uh, which I just had the privilege and honor of, of uh, accepting that position just about a month ago. So I kind of have two hats where I think about you know my role as board president with Black Outside uh, and as founder and lead volunteer, um, and then also what's happening at HEB camps. And so one thing is you know we're trying to uh, cross you know the state of Texas, figure this out to figure out what does it look like? What does procedurally look like? Do we even have the sheer resources to do some type of programming? But I will say our hope is, our hope, prayerfully, right, is that uh, I think summer camps a stretch, to be honest. Um, and I'm speaking strictly for Black Outside, not HEB camp. I'm speaking strictly for Black Outside. Um, but I think for us as a stretch, but we have thought about uh, what it looks like to um, maybe do some type of social distance where we have small groups doing yoga, right? And everyone's like spread apart. Uh, or we do like some type of activity in a park where everyone's separated and maybe people are just exploring on their own and nature journaling and people share out in a, in a safe, uh, physically distant way. So we're, all, we're already thinking about that. Obviously we would limit it to small groups, uh, but our hope is to have some form of probably day programming for the summer for Black Outside. Okay, I'm so glad <laughs> I didn't. I kept thinking about HEB camp and going, oh, I wonder where they fit into all of this. I'm so glad you're with them. I got to write about them um, in the fall. Yes. And out there for outdoor school. And oh gosh, I'm so happy that you are um, in a steering position there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I mean, I'll name too, just if there's anybody listening that has kids there, they're thinking obviously very critically about that. So. Um, you know, I think it's there's kind of this waiting hold in the next seven days. A lot of stuff for the summer is going to get kind of announced uh, because the governor is going to be putting out some guidelines and specifically uh, for summer programs uh, next Monday, actually. So I would just say also stay on the lookout there. Every parent in the state has bated breath about how they're much time they're going to have to spend with their kids. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, keep working, I, keep working at, I keep working at Young Life in Canacock and all these camps. If they officially made a determination yet, and they haven't, I think everybody's just kind of holding their breath. But I don't see much hope in summer camps in cabins, and and it, even if we're on the better end of this curve, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon. And the summer happens pretty quick, right? It's only twelve weeks. So, um, what what are some things we can do though uh, if can if summer camp is no go? Right. It's not we're not going to be meeting in these places and especially together in cabins and stuff. What can we do? What can what can we do? What can black outside do uh, to encourage uh, getting outside and connecting uh, with nature, even if we have to do it in social distancing? How, how are we how are we do, approaching this? 
Yeah, that's a that's an awesome question, and it's tough, right? I mean, but this is also a time for innovation, right? And that's one thing we've talked about internally on our team is like, how do we innovate? Think critically at this time. You know, again, how are we approaching? There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of like, especially in our community, in our black community, right? Um, but at the same time, there's also some some small opportunities that hopefully we can think differently about what even our programming looks like. And it's kind of funny for when Camp Founder Girls first started. Someone asked me like, "Are you gonna do a day camp?" And I was like, "No, only overnight camp. Only overnight camp." And here we are. I'm like, "Okay, well, God has like made a pivot here." So you know, we are thinking uh, about like practically speaking. You know, again, I think one big X factor is gonna be our parks open up, or one X factor is gonna be okay now private land. So what extent are you gonna open up? Maybe we have some type of day programming that's limited. So I think three things to think about are just obviously size, what spaces are available, um, and then just resources to make sure that safest space uh, that that space is safe, right? And our yeah. activities are yoga and hiking and things like that, where you can remain socially distant, but still get a lot of fresh air. Sure, and and if state parks open, which I think some of them started opening today. Yeah, they did, they uh, did. So those are opportunities and whether that's best practices or not will be determined uh, by a lot of different people, I would imagine, and a lot of opinions how best to do that. Uh, any other thoughts since we've been here almost an hour and 45 minutes, so we wanna respect everybody's time. I do want to give a shout out and we'll put it up here. Sweet Yams, right in San Antonio, Texas. Go support them. That was mentioned. Also, Squeezers uh, in South San Antonio. I hope I spelled that right. Uh, I hope that was good. Yeah, you did. Uh, right? You mentioned those two. Fun shout out to Sweet Yams. Um, my 30th birthday, I was super duper pregnant and did not want to go out or anything. And so we moved our dining table out into the backyard, had our best friends over and sweet yams came. Um, and just the two owners, uh, Shannon and her husband came and catered, uh, my 30th birthday party in the backyard. Uh, we lived down the street from them at the time. And so, but it was like my best birthday party ever, best food, best time and um sweet Yams has forever a place in my heart <laughs> i love that love uh, them. the last few minutes here uh it, just spend two minutes each uh langston and alex just your conclusion of of tonight and just a lasting uh memory you can give us uh we always joke that we can give a, a last two minute conclusion that makes sense for everyone even if We've spoken about a lot of things. So what would be your, what would be your lasting two comments? And we'll let Langston go first. So for me, I think it's uh, for us to be mindful of the importance that the outdoors has in our spirituality and our faith and having a broader understanding of what it means to connect with God. Um, and so I think sometimes we get caught up in going to a building or just um, reading our Bibles, which is good. Um, but I, I just think that, you know, what God has given us um, as black folk here on this planet is is expansive and we need to take advantage of the opportunity to enjoy every aspect of the earth. Uh, specific to San Antonio, I think um, this is an opportunity for us um, as a community or a group of black communities to be intentional about how we support one another and how we build social capital um, across institutions, um, across um, identities, because Black people are, are, are very diverse in terms of how they identify, um, to make sure that the next time something like this happens, that we're, we have some sort of social insulation against, um, you know, a virus, a pandemic, or even uh, some of the underlying conditions that make a situation like this worse for us. Alex, your last remarks. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, one, just thank you, Gavin and Becca, for the opportunity. Becca, like awesome questions. And um, I thank you, appreciate you for the work that you're doing uh, with especially the Christian community around racial reconciliation. And lastly, the work that you're doing on the border. Um, just so you know, my first teaching, the reason I got into teaching, I started teaching on the border in a small community called Roma, Texas. So um, they just, they're just a special place in my heart always because I always love those kids and they were my first students that I ever taught. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So we'll talk offline definitely yeah. about some of the stories. Yeah. Um, but I, I would definitely say, uh, yeah, as Langston mentioned, um, 
the outdoors and nature is such a powerful piece of spiritual development. And I think, you know, even in, within the black community, we got to continue to foster and push that and understand that and just think about the powerful like scriptures and Psalms where David's painting these pictures of being literally outdoors, like running away in fear, but also having time to rejuvenate his spirit. And I think about uh, Jesus and Jesus's life, him going to the wilderness for 40 days and what that meant for his life and his story and his trajectory. Right. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, one piece I would say is just continue to advocate for equitable access in spaces. Um, and from a spiritual piece, you know, take this time outdoors and outside to really see what's happening in our world, see the animals that are around us, listen to the birds that are chirping. I, you know, I notice I'm starting to smell uh, just less toxins in the air because we're driving a little bit less. And so uh, I think the song I'll, I'll end with just saying is like the song by Hillsong uh, titled So Will I paints this beautiful picture where uh, it talks about uh, God being the God of creation and that a hundred billion galaxies are born and just the vapor of God's breath. Right. And so we have such a beauty and privilege around us. There's a lot of suffering and pain. Um, but when you look at the trees and you look at God's hope and God's promise to us, uh, take that time to reflect on that and pray on it. Thank you. Uh, well, Beck, any, any lasting, lasting words? You're good. All right. I want to respect that. I want to kind of, anybody off early um guys thank you so much for being here uh what a powerful conversation of just what the transformative power of being outside can do uh in so many different people's lives uh spiritually uh communally um and in all different aspects in our communities and different types of communities it, it that is a lasting thing right uh nature is important no matter where you're from or where you're from or what resources you have and uh well, all if, if people, if you know people with land, connect them with Alex. If you know people with resources that can make this more equitable for everyone, connect them. Uh, because, uh, like you said, you're just a few years old and can only do so much right now. And our thoughts are with everyone right now in COVID-19 that we can stay uh, sane and find the appropriate places to go outside and to reconnect and just see the sunshine and, and know that there's another day ahead of us. So, guys, thank you so much for being here. We'll be back with another Public Theology next week uh, uh, at 7 p.m. with Dr. Colleen Bridger. She's the assistant uh, city manager over really all this COVID stuff because she's over Metro Health and Department of Human Services and all those factions of the city fall under Dr. Bridger's uh, oversight. And she's going to join us along with Reverend Dr. Kenneth Kemp from Antioch Baptist Church. Uh, he's the head pastor of a historically black congregation uh, on the east side, but he's also for years has been a medical doctor, right? Even before he was a pastor, he was an MD uh, with the army at Bamsey in North Carolina, uh, a great uh, man of faith, but also a very, very, very smart doctor. So I think having them both on at the same time will be interesting. So come join Dr. Bridger and Dr. Kemp as they uh, continue uh, this conversation that we're all living with in the COVID-19 pandemic. So guys, thanks for being here. Uh, remember- well, Happy Earth Day. There you go. Happy Earth Day How did we forget yeah. that completely? Yes. Oh my gosh, we should go back and record this whole thing and mention that. But it's yeah. Earth Day today uh, for a few more hours. Maybe you can donate uh, the organization that's out there. Um, and you can donate to probably Black Outside, right? Is there a way to donate to your organization? Yeah, definitely. Uh, shame. Well, not shameless plug. I'm not shameless about it at all. Uh, you can follow us. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Uh, our Instagram page is our favorite where we do a lot of posting. Black Outside Inc. along with our two other programs, CR Bloom Project and Camp Founder Girls. Uh, they have their own special uh, Instagram pages. And lastly, if you want to donate to our movement, it's uh, blackoutside.org slash donate. You can find donations there and know that donation in this time period is actually going to go to supporting a local family right now through small businesses starting Saturday. So uh, thank That's you so much. Blackoutside.org donate. There it is. We'll post it there the rest of the time. Uh, yeah, please, please, please share this. Uh, share this video. Uh, with different people, including you guys. You can share it on your Black Outside page and your personal pages. Anybody listening and watching again online, you can watch this video anytime after we go live. And the more we share and the more we can connect different uh, communities all around our city and our state. So, guys, thanks for being here. Have a blessed rest of the evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah.